so good at that thing. Welcome to all of you for the sixth annual Samsung uh, Memorial Lecture. Let me first of all welcome you all for this lecture. I request Professor Ranish Bhattacharya to uh, welcome our guest, Professor Pradeep Bhattacharya, by presenting him a bouquet on behalf of our guest. Getting to uh, 
instead two of the premier CSIR institute which are doing quite well in today's uh, perspective is really worthy of our admiration. Um, in mid 80s, Professor Babaji was offered a position at UWM uh, and he shifted base over there. But he has consistently kept in touch with whatever is happening within the country. He has incepted and initiated several uh, collaborative programs and uh, industrial research, <coughs> even while being at US. Professor Chohanki, to his credit, has 13 books and 340 papers in refereed journals. Um, he has 20 US patents and has received numerous awards for the excellence in research and for his service to the community. Uh, Professor Chohanki, we welcome you for today's lecture. Uh, I'd first like to thank the IIT for taking the risk of inviting somebody like me uh, who has been around for so long. And I'd like to express my thanks to Anish uh, who at very short notice said that I should give the lecture and I can never say no to him. And I would like to express my appreciation for Professor G.S. Upadhyay who has been a long time friend of mine to endow a lecture series in the name of Professor Samsonov. You know, when we were students uh, we used to follow, follow his books and hear about his work in, in the area of ceramics. And, uh, you know, before I get into my technical talk, I want to talk about things uh, that are not in the journals. You can read what I have said in journals and internet, but the human element, if you will allow five minutes. A uh, couple of things that uh, my association with IIT Kanpur is very old. When I was studying at Banaras, they said there's going to be an IIT and my dream was just to come here and teach. And when in 61, I graduated, myself and my father met Professor Kelkar at the Agriculture Institute. And I said, I want a lecturer's position and Dr. Kelkar, very magnanimous. He said, no, where else can you go? I said, I have an admission at MIT. He said, go there. And, and the idea was to come back here and I did come for a year, uh, come back here. So uh, my association and I was very proud to bring the first boxes from MIT here. It was like, I'm now, because MIT was the main player in setting it up. So my connection uh, goes back to 19, uh, 1961. And I remember Marshall Sittig and Marshall Merriam who were here right at the inception of MIT, uh, I mean IIT. I worked with them and I want to mention Marshall Merriam because he was looking at the shape memorial alloys and I will show you how I have used, uh, used uh, them at, in my current work. The other thing I did, the abstract says I will talk about the contribution of IIT Kanpur to my group, to my work, life, life's work, and let me share with you. I had discovered this cast metal matrix composite in a company, Inco, and in 1967 or 68, they said, you, we are going to stop work on it. This has no future. At that time, I had a visiting assistant professorship here, and it was IIT Kanpur who allowed me to continue to work in that field. They were concerned, as far as they were concerned, it was a dead end, nothing will come. So I am very grateful for that one year I spent, and I had the best set of students uh, during that year here. And I will mention a couple of names. There was Professor Subrat Ray. In his master's thesis, he solved a problem of mixing particles in the liquid to make composite materials. And like most of the master students, he never bothered to publish it for 20 years. Then he came to me as a postdoc in Milwaukee in 1988, and we published his work of 20 years back that was done for his master's thesis. And he opened the door because we, we were here in Kanpur, we could not get the nickel coated powders that were needed. So he introduced the, he discovered the magnesium as a wetting agent to aluminum that allows you to mix a non-wettable ceramic particle. The other student was a bachelor student, Ashok Khare, at that year. And Ashok discovered adding graphite to copper using titanium as a wetting agent. And I think the first two Indian patents were filed with these three people. I still remember two patents with Dr. Kelkar as the third, uh, third inventor. 
they were filed probably they were the first patents filed out of India I mean out of IIT Kanpur but Khare's work 25 years later at Milwaukee as you know lead in water has become a big problem so the solution of lead in water was the copper graphite that was started started here and uh, so you know I, that year was a very productive year I think it allowed this field to start it would have been buried otherwise in the US and then uh, further acknowledgement when I was setting up the Bhopal lab it was graduates from here three people who had done their uh, degrees at IIT, uh, Dr. Das, who is the current director at Bhopal, uh, Modi and Jha, they were, I think, Dr. Upadhyay's, G.S. Upadhyay's students, so they were, uh, they built up the lab, Bhaskar Mazumdar, so there's a lot of uh, IIT association that, that was there and I owe a great deal. Uh, I used to, in 68, that is 48 years ago, I think I used to lecture in L4, so I'm very much back to where I started my journey uh, here and as I mentioned, I, in my abstract, I will talk about contributions to India, uh, from India to this field. I am very uh, happy to share with you that it is one area in metallurgy, there are others, one of the few areas where India and Indians have a leadership in the world and I will show you, it is not my statement but by others. Indian Institute of Science, Dr. Surappa discovered aluminum silicon carbide that is now commercially used material, it is produced. and <coughs> Dr. Krishnan and, and, and Pai, my PhD students, they for the first time produced pistons and liners and they published and the whole thing was forgotten. And 35 years later, now my students, current students have set up a company to produce what, what, what was discovered here. And it's not only the, I, I could list about uh, 50 people in India who have made major landmark contributions and I must say that I'm very blessed that I have students and grand students in India who have kept the flag of India in this field, in this field flying. And those people who were never in India, somehow Indians take to this metal matrix composites. If you look at US, uh, Nikhil Chawla and Chris Chawla, I mean, they have written a seminal book in this field. If you go to Singapore, it's Manoj Gupta. So I think it's a field that has attracted and it, it has been a privilege to uh, just see this field grow. About four, four weeks ago, we just heard about a major pro project from DOE that has been granted uh, to, to, to my institute and I'll serve as the node leader on, it's called Remade, reducing the energy content embodied in materials. And it's, it was given around this that you can make ultra strong materials or you can put waste materials like fly ash in metals. So the stuff that was done here 20, 30, 40 years later has become, uh, become a fashion. So I, as I said that I before I get into the technical part, I wanted to recapture and a couple of messages for young students, uh, don't take a no. My boss in the United States in 68 said, this field is dead, uh, uh, how will you prevent the, the agglomeration of particles? Uh, there is no future, but I persisted. That's my message number one. My message number two, sitting in India you can be world leaders, you don't have to be sitting there and I will show you that my most cited paper was written in India with a colleague who was a graduate of IIT, IIT Kanpur. And my third message is, uh, have a passion and carry it through your whole life if you want to be the leader in the world. I have been a professor, I have been a director uh, and, and worked in industry for 10 years but never gave up my, my passion for cast composites, you need that. You don't have to be ultra smart, I'm not, I'm a small man, not very smart, but I think just staying, staying with the field. And if somebody tells you you can't work in the area of your passion, leave that place. Go to a place and that's what happened with IIT Kanpur. When it was no in, uh, no in, uh, in the United States, IIT Kanpur and then later on Indian Institute of Science and then the CSR allowed me to, allowed me to work in this area. Let me share with you another thing. There are many problems in India, but one of the things you don't realize, you are free to work in the area you want to work. In US, unless you have research funding, you can't buy a pencil. So please utilize, and I've always told my friends, for me and other self-motivated people, India is a better place than the United States. You can create in an area, and you never work as well as in an area that you are interested in, you know, and, and that's, please utilize that opportunity, and I, I think as, as we move forward, we can, I foresee Indians who have never left the uh, left India would, would take leadership because 
I think 20 to 30 percent leaders in material science in US now are of Indian origin. The next stage is that people who, have, who will just stay here, never leave, will produce, uh, produce great things and they will be world leaders and it's a matter of time. So that's the challenge I want to throw to the, uh, to the students uh, before I get into my, my technical task. You are sitting on a great opportunity. Uh, you know, you, you need to look at Pichaya and Satya Nadella, graduates from here who are running the top company. So that's what, what is in your brain. And I, and I hope I, I see more of this leadership in other areas in, uh, in material science. So as I said, I'm going to get into, uh, get into my, my uh, technical talk. And uh, as I said, I have always worked uh, in response to a societal need. I did my PhD in water freezing because that was one way to produce fresh water. So I always begin with wish list of the society, double barrel problems where there is fundamental science, but more than that, I say to myself, if you succeed, will you do any good to the day-to-day -day needs of the people? So you begin with wish list and you design a microstructure to meet properties. You design a process to make samples. Make and test samples, modify, modify the process. Make prototypes and it's Wisconsin industry, but it could be any, any industry. Unless you can make something in large numbers, you are never going to do good to the society. That's why synthesis, processing, and manufacturing are, are very important. No matter how good a material you discover, if you can't make it, uh, it won't go very far. I uh, maybe, uh, you know, many of you know about it, but basically composites are, are you either introduce fibers, long fibers, or short fibers, or particulates in a matrix. Everybody knows about polymer matrix. In my case, the matrix has been metal. I have some work on polymers and the and the reinforcements that I have put in are, are ceramics, they could be other metals. So that is what the definition of metal matrix composites is, a combination of a metal and, 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 and ceramic. And it's this simple concept that has allowed me to get into uh, self-healing materials, self-lubricating materials, self-cleaning uh, and smart materials. And as I said, the, the process that, that I was very fortunate to stumble into it right after my, my PhD was the star mixing project that you take a liquid metal and you stir, very simple, uh, you know, just like you stir uh, sugar in a glass or something, and these particles get dispersed and then you freeze it and you produce a composite, a very simple low cost process. And here is my industry partner in Wisconsin. I do it in 1020 pounds, he does it in 400 pounds. And this is where Dr. Subratre worked out the thermodynamics and kinetics of transfer of particles or fibers from gas phase to liquid phase and then to solid phase. I'm not going to get into the fundamental science because there is not time, but it's in the papers if anybody is interested. So that, that's, uh, that's the upscaling and this is what I was looking at when I was working on it in India. Uh, but people said, well, let's Americans and Japanese do it, then we will work with you. That's another thing I hope uh, you, the industry or you will fight it. Don't wait for Americans to do, we can do here before anybody else can does. This guy, I will later on show you, has just a bachelor's degree from a very like private school in Milwaukee, but his passion was metal composites. So when I moved, he came there and he told his boss he wants to set up a manufacturing of metal composites. The boss said no, but then he finally said, I'll give you a hundred square feet of space. You can do it provided you can sell enough prototypes. So a small man with no PhD or no IIT education is the route to manufacture these things and to sell it. And the sh story I want to share with you that it's the passion of one person, not, not big names that you need to produce. And I'll come back to this later. The other process was that you can produce a bed of fibers or particles in a tube. You melt liquid metal, you apply pressure and the liquid metal infiltrates. And I'm happy to see some chemical engineering people who know much more about Darcy's law than, than I do. And, and you have the infiltration and then you let the liquid cool and solidify. So this is called the pressure infiltration process. And as I said, this was first actually discovered by a student of mine, an undergraduate student in Bangalore. He did the first experiment of pressure infiltration uh, of, of liquid metals. Chemistry people had done with, uh, with non-metallic metal years. And in pressure infiltration, you will make a preform, you will introduce the liquid metal 
and then the liquid metal solidifies around these fibers or particles. There is a lot of science that I will not get into it, the nucleation around the particles, the growth, and how does it change the segre micro segregation in the middle of fibers. That, that is a lot of science. It was done here and then later on uh, at MIT. And this has been now moved into a point where you will make a preform. By 3D printing, you will make a near net shape preform of ceramics and then you will enclose this in a mold. You will melt liquid metal and apply pressure and the liquid metal infiltrates the preform and you get a near net shaped high volume reinforced metal matrix composite part. So that's the name of the game to marry 3D printing with trying to produce these parts. And as I said, upscaling is important. So this company person I was telling you, uh, it's 80 miles from my place. He has become the biggest producer of metal matrix composite parts for German railways and for automotive sectors. Just his boss gave him a little space and one furnace. So this is showing how you are able to pour aluminum silicon carbide composite like you pour a conventional aluminum. So there is nothing in this technology that cannot be done in Kanpur or or, or, or any, any small foundry lab here. And the microstructures that we create, this is Cephil fiber, alumina silicate fiber dispersed in aluminum produced by pressure infiltration. And this has been running in diesel engine pistons by Toyota for many years. So what I'm talking about has been in industry and I'll show you. This is silicon carbide in the matrix of aluminum again made by pressure infiltration, every computer that you have, every laptop, this is what manages, this is for thermal management. It has got very high ability to, to transmit heat. So this is used in computer components and then later on I will show you, these are the two microstructures with 70 volume percentage and 60 volume percentage silicon carbide. Uh, the other composite, the first composite that I was able to synthesize was graphite in aluminum. And the story is very, I want to share the stories more than the technical parts you can read. A gentleman from General Motors came, he says, I'm using cast iron to make cars, but it is so heavy. Can you make something lighter, which has graphite? So you look at the phase diagram of aluminum and graphite, and there is no miscibility. You can't have a cast iron. So I said, I will add graphite from outside. Very simple idea, no high uh, quantum theory involved. And that allowed me to introduce graphite and then silicon carbide and then micro balloons and so on. So it's, it's, not, it's not something that you need to be highly theoretical to produce something, something useful. So you can create a variety of uh, composite microstructures with different properties and you can tailor properties. Why, am I, why interest in composites? This is a plot of specific modulus versus specific strength. The higher the specific modulus and specific strength, the lighter will be the material. If your cars and trains were lighter, they will consume less energy and less global warming. So the monolithic metals are here, and these are the metal matrix microcomposites. So you are moving along these diagonals, and the nanocomposites that I am working on are going along this diagonal. So progressively you can make your cars, trains, trucks lighter here by getting into the field of micro and nanocomposites and learning about the pollution in New Delhi because of cars, here is an answer. You can reduce the weight of your transportation systems. And a lot of interest, again, showing that specific strength and modulus, monolithic aluminum is here, aluminum reinforced with fibers is here, and now the new interest is in magnesium. Magnesium is even lighter. So by going into magnesium composites, you are going along these lines, the ability to make transportation systems lighter and uh, lighter and lighter. Now why is it used in every computer that you have? Because the coefficient of thermal expansion versus thermal conductivity, specific thermal conductivity lambda by rho, this has to be equal to the silicon chip. Earlier people were using covar and invar that were very light, but aluminum silicon carbide is here. So it has much less density compared to covar and it transmits, it acts as a thermal, thermal heat sink. And as we go into graphene reinforced copper, you will see that this even moves further and further. So that's why for thermal management, in fact, we were developing it for transportation, but thermal management applications uh, came much before it. Now, uses. As I said, when I was here and I would talk to industry, they said, oh, let Americans use it. So now I have a way to tell you that this has been used 
in aircraft these are all different aircraft parts in which metal matrix composites are today flying and in the Hubble telescope the antenna this was aluminum carbon and now aluminum silicon carbide the trusses of orbiter these are again aluminum reinforced with boron so these things are flying there is no reason now with our growing manufacture for aerospace industry there is no reason that why these things are, are not produced here these are components for yeah bo boron fiber you know boron fiber is manufactured so you embed boron fiber in aluminum and that produces a very high stiffness composite material so it is continuous boron fiber these are the components in water uh, in, in automotive this is a cylinder liner of Honda Prelude you see here is the reinforcement here and this is made by a single step pressure infiltration casting in one shot you produce and you see here the fibers are reinforcing and this allows you to make the engine smaller and lighter okay the brake rotors in many cars uh, the brake rotors they used to be cast iron but if you make them out of aluminum silicon carbide they are only 65 percent of the weight so the cars become lighter uh, the drive shafts were used and in german railways all the brakes that are there are aluminum silicon carbide we have such a large railway system and they still use steel or cast iron brakes so here is an opportunity uh, to transform uh, you know to reduce fuel consumption by manufacturing these things in india another example i talked about thermal management so in a in in a toyota prius the 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 chip the backing of the silicon chip is a metal matrix composite mmc which is a silicon carbide reinforced aluminum so these things are are flying and they are running and they are in computer so there's no reason you don't have a problem that i had 40 years ago uh, why should we produce this in india and use it somebody else so now proven uses are there i could go on i did talk about magnesium that is the new buzzword in which everybody is getting on because it is even lighter uh, this is the weight of iron weight of aluminum and magnesium so there's a lot of activity in magnesium matrix composites because magnesium has a low modulus and if you put carbon fibers or carbon nanotubes or graphene you could make magnesium much stronger and much more stiffer and it is very light so this is the new game and we are working on this ourselves you know and as you can add particles or fibers to magnesium they become much stronger let me talk to you about a little bit about the potential applications i did talk about putting graphite in aluminum and it makes aluminum self lubricating the friction coefficient goes down the wear rate goes down and that is why it is a very desirable materials for pistons and liners and so on so a single step centrifugal casting process where the graphite was dispersed non uniformly in a melt when i centrifuge they bring the graphite to the inner periphery and that's where you need it for bearings and for cylinder liners a single step process to produce a functionally gradient composite which can be manufactured this was funded by by ford and by introducing graphite the coefficient of friction comes down from 0.8 to 0.2 so a lot of energy in indian cars could be reduced if you use the self lubricating lightweight aluminum graphite uh, graphite cylinder liners and as i said in us you work very closely with industry so these are compressors and a lot of our trucks these are air brake compressors of heavy trucks they they are made, they were made out of cast iron and they still are made out of cast iron in india here now we have made it out of aluminum and the liner here is a composite aluminum composite liner again produced at that little guy small company near milwaukee and this has been tested in military trucks in cement trucks i see no reason why the transformer i mean the the compressors used and by using composite liners we showed that you save uh, you save the energy you save the oil bypass and so on so the actual field tests were done in this area now when i was in india i kind of started to get interested in putting waste by products in aluminum to make it cheaper and this work started in trivandrum to put fly ash and india produces 80 million tons of fly ash and out of which i think 10 20 million is used for bricks the rest is all landfill you go to panki and you will see uh, fly ash polluting the air we discovered processes to put fly ash in aluminum and 2% of that fly ash is perfectly hollow spheres 
you will pay a lot of money to make it synthetic. Here is a waste material. So we incorporated hollow microspheres of fly ash by pressure infiltration. So this is aluminum and these are hollow microspheres. And this composite can absorb more energy per unit weight than any of the highest strength armor steels. So military is very interested in it and in cars, you know, when you have an accident, uh, you, you will be protected if you have this kind of energy absorbing material. So here is an example of taking a waste byproduct. Now in this composite, you need much less aluminum because 60% is replaced by this waste byproduct. And we are now progressively working, these, these are micro balloons of fly ash. We are now looking at nano balloons in metals to produce nano, nano composite materials. No, these are aluminosilicate. We have put carbon, we have put alumina, any, any xenospheres, but the best is to use fly ash. And Indian fly ash is F. In fact, with late Dr. Batra, who passed away some years ago at IIT, we did a lot of work looking at punky fly. Indian fly ash is in better because it is F fly ash. And then to make car parts, you can encapsulate these syntactic forms, fly ash in metal, in steel, hollow steel, uh, tubes to produce structural frames. So this again was done by my industry partner to produce these things. And I was talking about energy absorption versus strength. And this was the this is the uh, this is the range of properties that are available today. And our group in Milwaukee produce magnesium syntactic foams and aluminum syntactic foams, which have the highest energy absorbing capability of anything that has been researched to date. And syntax, you see, no, normally you have open cell foams. You have seen styrofoam, the, the, the stuff in which it is an open cell foam. The, the hollow spaces are connected to air. Syntactic foams are where you put hollow microspheres in a metal so that the hollow space is not connected to air. That is the definition of a syntactic foam. So my <laughs> students love to show army people that they can have a floating metal with density less than one. This is magnesium reinforced with carbon micro balloons. And you know, you can see the interest in army and navy and uh, ships and all that, that you can have a very light material. Uh, lead is a very heavy material for lead acid batteries. Could they be lighter? So we incorporated hollow micro balloons in lead to reduce the density to half of that of lead. But still the problem has to be changed that it has the requisite conductivity to be in a lead acid battery. This is where India has a better opportunity. My funding agency said, all right, you have put it, funding cuts. Funding is cut, so I stopped working. Maybe you guys can take and show that this can be light, this can be a route to lighter uh, lead acid batteries, okay? And this ability to put, this ability to put hollow particles in metals, I, I was able to extend it to produce self-healing metallic materials. <coughs> You see, your bone, if it fractures, if you keep it in place, it repairs itself. If your skin is scratched, you have blood flow there and it repairs itself. Can we teach in organic materials the self-healing capability? And this was the work done in polymers at the University of Illinois, where they put hollow micro balloons and a monomer in it, and a catalyst was embedded in the matrix. If there was a crack here, it will break open the micro balloon the monover will flow out and it will react with the catalyst and it will solidify. So you seal the crack autonomously in a polymer. And because we were coming, and I want to share this story because how you are able to do something, not because you are very smart. All you did, I saw this and I said, wait a minute, I know how to put hollow micro balloons in metals. I will teach this to my metals to be, uh, be self-healing. So what we did, my students who were working with composites, they had this matrix of metal and they produced hollow, hollow tubes in it and in that they put a he low melting healing agent. So we created the same counterpart that was done for polymer matrices in metals. And we have fun, my students, they will drill a hole and they will show that you can seal it. So self-healing and self-healing materials and our, our ability to do this basically came from our ability to make metal composites. So here is aluminum, this is a hollow tube in which there is a healing agent produced by a pressure infiltration technique. And then remember I was telling you about Marshall Merriam in 1968. So I remembered his work on shape memory alloy which remembers its shape. 
Uh, you could have a wire like this, you could mangle it, it becomes like this, you pour hot water and it remembers its shape. I'm not going to get into the phase transfer, I'm sure you people have studied this in your, in your physical metallurgy. So this property of shape memory is used to make a self-healing material. You will take aluminum, you will put shape memory alloy wires to form a metal composite. You pull it, aluminum being weaker breaks, but the wires remain because they are stronger. Now when you supply heat to this cracked material, the shape memory alloy remembers its shorter shape, it shrinks. It shrinks and now it brings the two broken parts together and if there is enough heat, they re-weld. So this is the route for shape memory alloy reinforced metal composite to become self-healing. And here, this is not my work from Northwestern. You see this crack here, it has gone away. If you can see this crack here, it has gone away. So we are able to produce self-healing properties and this is the work of another IIT graduate student of Dr. Upadhyay, Anish. Uh, 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 Shobit Mishra, he introduced long fibers of shape memory alloy in a solder and he will bend the tube and put it on the simple heater and then it will straighten by itself. So here is the bent tube, just by heating it straightens by itself. Imagine if your car has an accident and you put it in a heater and it repairs the dent or anything that fails and then if you had a big crack by heating the crack can be narrowed down. So this is uh, self-healing work. We have tried it in polymers also. A big crack here, you heat it, you see the crack is closed. A big crack here and it is closed, you know. It's still in, 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 in great infancy. We can do it in the lab, but how to make it, uh, make it uh, come? It's a very exciting field uh, to, to get into smart smell, self-healing materials. Imagine you can extend the fatigue life. If there's a fatigue crack, it repairs itself instead of extending and breaking the material. So the life of components and you can use weaker materials, you don't need high fatigue life because the cracks can be, cracks can be repaired. I did mention why am I getting into nano composites because the reinforcements are much stronger. Graphene has a, has a uh, uh, strength and modulus in terapascal. So if I can put it in metals, I can produce really strong materials. So nano composites are, are, are a very exciting field and we have got uh, got, gotten into nano composites. I'm not going to get into the mechanisms of strengthening, which include Oravon strengthening, Hall patch strengthening, uh, CT mismatch strengthening, uh, load transfer. The, these are all standard textbooks. But the interesting part that you can modify strength uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, and the reason why nano composites are better because you get much higher Oravon strengthening. A, a large particles, the spacing is much larger. With smaller nanoparticles, the spacing is much smaller. Therefore, the stress to move dislocations goes up to very high values. And that's why nanoparticles will give you much stronger, uh, much stronger strength. And the excitement is if you are looking at shuttle orbiter, a polymer composite will weigh so much, a carbon nanotubes in polymer will be 60% lighter, but if you put nanotubes in aluminum, you will be 68% lighter. And if you put graphene in aluminum, it will even be lighter. That is what is driving, uh, driving me and many others to work on uh, CNT and graphene reinforced metals. Now, very simple, the same technique that we were using here, I think 48 years ago, Mr. Prithipal Singh was running the foundry. I think it's been disbanded now. Same kind of thing, a little melt here, a mechanical stirrer and an ultrasonic stirrer and you produce a nano composite. These are nano size 47 nanometer particles of aluminum oxide dispersed in aluminum. So very simple technique that you can produce uh, these nano composite materials. Now, it is much easier to make them by powder metallurgy. And I will show you the potential of properties. This is made by powder metallurgy. And these are nano size particles of alumina, 15 volume percentage particles, 20 nanometer size. But let me show you the properties. If you can put 50 nanometer, 10 percent particles, you can get a strength in aluminum of 515 MPa. It is more than that of steel. So for the density of aluminum, you can get the strength equal to that of steel. So that is what you can get in nano composites. Even the friction coefficient in nano composite is much lower, the wear rate is much lower. So not only advantages in mechanical strength properties, but also in other properties. The way to make nano composites is same. You melt it, you introduce nanoparticles, 
you have a little ultrasonic dispersion and you just cast. Any simple foundry, many of them were in Kanpur city itself could be producing, uh, producing these things. Uh, my recent work on putting graphene uh, nanoparticles in, in, alumina, uh, in aluminum, we are trying both melt but the powder metallurgy is the easier route because of reaction between graphene and aluminum. So what we do is we ball mill, ball mill graphene with aluminum and then we cold compact, hot compact. This is a field that I've been trying to work with Dr. Upadhyay, it's more powder metallurgy. And we are able to produce, uh, produce nano composites here. And this is the microstructure. See, this is 100 nanometer scale. You are able to produce grains in aluminum that are nanometer size. And the graphene platelets are here. So you produced an aluminum graphene nanocomposite. The challenge, I still have these oxide particles and I hope one of the students can figure out how to do powder metallurgy of aluminum without alumina. And then the nano, nano graphene, the graphene platelets are at the grain boundaries. They are not within the grains. That's the challenge in this field. You will not get one strengthening. You will still get some strengthening and stiffening, but not as much. So this is a challenge for powder metallurgy people. How to do right so that you have nano, nano graphene. Very quickly, in US you are driven a lot by industry. So unless you produce a prototype part, no industry looks at you. So I just wanted to very quickly show that we have made pistons, connecting rods, liners, uh, you know, uh, this is made in a pressure die casting company, a self-lubricating aluminum graphite liner produced in an actual industry part. Uh, this is what was the base was Khare's work here in 1968. These are the copper graphite which are substitute for copper lead bearings and copper lead pipes that we use in Kanpur. Uh, you can produce these things and you don't require a high-tech company to produce. It can be produced right in Kanpur's uh, brass foundries. Uh, this is a hybrid composite where in a matrix we put, we were first putting either graphite or silicon carbide, then, then I decided to put both the hard reinforcement and self-lubricating reinforcement and I will show you that we produce liners uh, which reduce fuel consumption in cars. This is parts of aluminum fly ash. I was able to make it in that little foundry next to me who, who said come and play in my foundry. Uh, even though you are a professor and academician, I will like it. And he was smart. He knew that if I demonstrate how I can make it, he will one day get into production. So they are not stupid to let you utilize their facilities. This is the compressor that I had shown you earlier. People from iron and steel came. They said, hey, can you help me make iron and steel lighter? So this is spherical alumina particles in the matrix of ductile iron. And they allow you to make ductile iron stiffer and lighter. So there is opportunity in the area of iron also. This is from a paper we, lo we wrote uh, in Advanced Materials and Processes that you can produce wear resistant, lightweight, self-cleaning, self-lubricating, self-healing, high thermal conductivity, high strength and low cost materials by metal matrix composites. And they can be used for cylinder liners, pistons, camshafts, uh, lifters, rocker, brake components, water pumps, water jackets, bearings, journals, uh, you know, and, and so on, connecting rods. So this, this number of this number of automotive parts can be made by these materials that can be produced in very, uh, very simple foundries. Now, I want to share another story. I have been working in this for for many years, publishing papers, patents, and getting people PhDs and masters. There were two lowest grade students in my class, and they were not even materials people. They were working in my lab on an hourly, like, a, like, you know, clean this dish and so on. So these two gentlemen said, wait a minute, Mr. Professor, you have made this liner, you have shown it works in a compressor, how about setting up an industry? I said, I am a faculty person, this is not what I do. So this gentleman used to sell lemonade in Florida. A lemonade stand, children sit in America that you pay one dollar. So that, that is the only an enterprise training he had. So these two gentlemen who had the lowest grades in the class, civil engineering people, got together with this gentleman, David Weiss. He is the guy who was making composites from me in the foundry. And they set up a company, Intelligent Composites, and they have a startup to produce these cylinder liners for motorcycles in the beginning and then for cars and trucks and so on. So finally, I've been involved towards the end of my career 
in manufacturing and it did not require an Ambani or Tata. It required two very low grade students with this, th this guy who is a regular foundry man with a bachelor's degree. This is what creates an enterprise and their projections In self-cleaning, I have taken out those PowerPoints. I will talk to you separately. They are, I'm trying to use composites to produce hydrophobic and superhydrophobic surfaces. And the interest is they will reduce corrosion and they will also reduce the energy required to transmit water. So, uh, you know, they, I used to give lectures here with Dr. Ashutosh Sharma, but today I've kept it up that I'll be happy to talk to you about it and, and pick your brains on how to work on that area. So these, these, the potential available markets for metal matrix composite cylinder liners is $200 billion a year. If it got into every car, 70 million cars are produced every scooter. Immediate market is 10 billion, served available market 200 million a year. And the very first step is only going to be 3 million a year. India produces more motorcycles than anybody else in the world. And these liners are now being tested in motorcycles in US and they are proving themselves to work. So this could eventually lead to an enterprise. I wish it had happened in India and I still wish it happens in India that you become the people to produce this. We will send you the data that how <coughs> it has been tried in motorcycles so people have confidence in producing. Here is an opportunity to eventually set up an industry in India, $200 billion a year, believe it or not. Not only for consumption in India but to export to all over the world. And why do I say that? Remember I said in the beginning, India has leadership in the world. When I moved here from here back to US, General Motors came to me in Milwaukee and they said, is there an error that the Office of Technology Assessment says India is the leader in metal matrix composites? I said, no, John, there is no error. India is the leader. We have more people trained in this. And I really am grateful to the institutions who allowed me to work, including IIT Kanpur in this area, even though at that time Americans were saying it has no future. And to the students, and I'm very blessed that now I have not only my students, but my grand, stu grand students and my great grand students are still working in this area in India. So as I said that this is a report, there was a global industry analyst, a global strategic business report. And see the first line, India holds a leading position in research in cast metal composites. I feel very good about it. It's not a credit to me, it's a credit to you people who have done consistent research even after I left to get this. And not many technologies are there out of India where you will see India has a leading position. It has some in agriculture, but in materials, this may be one of the very few technologies. And then it talks about the transportation. And this report sees the railways as the biggest immediate application that, that you can go in. And you know, another thing, this independent, I didn't even know about this report. He says, presence of qualified human resources would alleviate the development. They knew that India has more trained people in cast metal matrix composites, and that's why India is more suited to set up an industry than people where you, don't ha you have no work, uh, work in this area, okay? Another power source, okay. I think this is telling me to, I'm at the end of my, my talk anyways. That, 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 that's okay now. I think this that is the... So as I said that I have done my best work in India and you say, look, I don't believe you. And here is a proof. This is the, everybody these days goes for citation index. My most referred paper is with a co-author, Dr. Das, who is a graduate of IIT Kanpur. I've lived in the United States, but my most, you will see the most cited papers are all, all done here. And why I say that, that don't put it past that you have to go to the United States or study at MIT you can do right here. And I, I look forward that many of the people who are here, uh, without ever leaving the shores of India, could, could take this leadership. You know, it was done right here with people like you. And I think that is the potential. And I hope some of you get excited about the industrial potential of metal matrix composites. $200 billion a year. And it does not require any sophisticated uh, equipment that is not in Indian foundries. I visited copper foundries in Kanpur. I visited copper aluminum foundries in Kanpur. They, they can produce these things. And the, the scooter people and the uh, motorcycle people can start to use. And then you go into cars and 
trucks and railways and so on. So I, I think I'll stop here. I hope I've, my basic message is not the technical part. You can read it in my paper. It is the human element that how you must have a passion and stay with it no matter where you are. And, and don't, don't be discouraged if somebody says, oh, it has no future. You, if it, you have it, uh, I often ask myself when I first discovered cast composites, why did I, something inside me, maybe God or whoever, said, Pradeep, stay with this, this is your future. And I'm sure everybody gets that feeling, listen to that carefully and stay with it, you know. Whether it's US or whether it's CSR or whether it's IIT or CS, Indian Institute, I told people, I'm going to work on this area. If you say no, I'll leave. Okay. It did happen in Bhopal. The director general said, you can't publish more than one paper a year. I said, I'm leaving. You understand? So be, be willing to pay the price. And I think each one of you have the potential to build a world leadership in the fields that you are interested in. And I hope I see more of that. Thank you so much for your, your time. And uh, please, please do. I hope it gets funded and you can. So we are looking forward to the Center for Excellence in this area. And the second thing, we also have two proposals that are in this national scheme. One by Professor Palo Mandel, he has initiated on very fast. I think by Professor Mosul Kulkarni on road transport. That means these components of radio. Well, I, I hope you get funded and you, uh, you can be leaders in, in this. So if the story can come back from IIT Kanpur <laughs> back to IIT Kanpur. Very nice to hear that. Uh, there is interest in funding research in railways. I did talk to RDSO when I was here many years ago, and they were not interested. They said, let, let other countries prove it, then we will be interested. And that is the tendency, I hope, to young people that please fight that tendency. You don't have to depend upon United States or, or Japan. We were ahead of everybody here. Only thing is our industry does not have that hunger that I want to be number one. I have met Mr. Ratan Tata's assistants, not him. I have met Mr. Pawan Goenka. I said, why don't you start producing and using it? But uh, that, that is where I hope some of the young people, we are now moving into a new India, that, that, that you, you do it. Don't, don't worry about others to wait. When we were doing this work, nobody was doing it in the in, in United States or Japan. You know. and, and that is the spirit. You know, some of you may become entrepreneurs. Please try to take pride that you were number one in producing. America was not built by professors like me. It was built by Thomas Edison's General Electric. You know, these people who wanted to produce something for the first time in the world and then sell it all over the world. And I, and I hope some of you decide to do that. And not only you will publish, if you set up an industry, you will be rich. But more than that, you will create jobs. Just in Wisconsin, I've tried to tell the governor there this set up an MMC industry, it could create 2,000 jobs in, in just one state in US. It could produce probably 100,000 jobs in India if, if foundries were producing this. You know. The Chinese will make sure all foundries in India will shut down because nobody can produce cheaper than them. But if you produce these, they can't catch up with it because they can't do very high tech stuff. Fly ash, if it is solid fly ash, it's an aluminosilicate. So it will be 2.9, close to that, depending upon the alumina silica ratio. But if it is hollow, that 2% of the fly ash is hollow, that density is 0 0.4. It's a hollow microsphere. Okay, that is what I do. I, I pack them, very simple, just pack them, and then infiltrate liquid metal in such a way that the particles are not able to float. And liquid metal flows, you have got chemical engineering experts who will t tell you the pressure required and the Darcy's law, and then you cool it, the liquid metal solidifies between the hollow microspheres, and you produce a high volume percentage composite that way. Otherwise, you can stir mix and cast it, you know.
Please. Uh, this is regarding the composites uh, that you have shown, particularly the hollow sphere composites. Uh, like so we carry out a lot of work on fatigue. Mm -hmm. I can understand that uh, for fatigue, crank growth, and all, you know, you can get a lot of crank branching because of all these hollow spheres. Right, right. <coughs> I was wondering, like, you also uh, not really compromise, but a uh, little bit on the modulus part. So, how much does the modulus uh, scale up? Uh, because you see, if you put uh, silicon carbide the modulus goes up because it is stiffer than aluminum. Right, right. If you put hollow particles, the modulus comes down. There is no, no two, two ways about it. Right, right. So you try to use in applications where high strength and high modulus is not required, but you need lighter weight. And there are many components like transmission housings. So I recommend aluminum fly ash for applications which are no stress or low stress. If you open your car hood, there are many pans, oil pans, valve covers where there is no stress. This is the ideal material for that. When you need high strength, high modulus, then you put silicon carbide or carbon fiber or now graphene. So the whole range is from what I like to do is, you know, polymer people have been ahead for a long time. They put clay in polymers to make your plastic tables cheaper. And this is the counterpart that our group in India thought of filled metals and 30 years later the DOE is funding that work for me that can you reduce the energy content of metal by filling it with a dust or dust or maybe little similar part so that whole concept of what has been in polymers for a long time uh, and then of course that is filled metals and highly reinforced will be graphenes and CNTs uh, you, you, you put in there and as I said that uh, there are many problems in the future. You did want me to comment on, 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 on future. I, I see, you will see nanocomposites with ultra high strength and graphene, with graphene as reinforcement in the future. You will see a lot of growth in self-healing materials. Uh, it, it, it's being researched, but you will see a lot of interest in it because it can allow you to use lighter, poorer strength materials because fatigue cracks will be, uh, will be repaired. You will see a lot of use in self-lubricating composites. Because restrictions are being put, you cannot put a car on the road unless it goes 55 to 100 miles a gallon. So you will need self-lubricating uh, self materials. But there are many fundamental science challenges. How do you control the distribution? It has to be uniform. I showed you the problem. How do you create bonding at the interface between reinforcement and the matrix? Otherwise, load will not be transferred. Okay. About mixing, simple stir mixing, there is a lot of science. The chemical engineering people understand it much better than materials people. The kind of impellers, the speed, how do you get a uniform dispersion, how do you prevent the suspension and segregation. So that whole rheology of suspensions with liquid metal as a medium is important. Of course, you have to reduce the cost. That's why I got into fly ash uh, in metals. If you can reduce the cost and produce on a large scale, this is the future a replacement for cast iron. And as I said, that uh, the applications are in transportation, but the applications in biomedical. The medical college is very excited about self-lubricating metals for joints, you know, the uh, arthritic joints. They are very interested in out-of-support body systems. See, all our wheelchairs and everything are made out of steel. And you know, the disabled people have to lift that. It's not, so why not make it out of this ultralight materials? Uh, you, you probably will see the scooters, the battery is so heavy. So making things lighter is going to be a challenge, uh, both in transportation and biomedical applications. So it's a, and as I said, there is nothing in this technology that cannot be done in India. You have foundries that are better than foundries. Uh, you know, this gentleman who is in a foundry, I, I have looked at foundries in Delhi. They are much cleaner and neater than foundries in Wisconsin. But it is that passion that I will be the first one to produce is, that's what makes the difference. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. No, the, the self-healing material, there are two schemes. One is to put a healing agent encapsulated in a micro. Oh, cleaning? Oh, I, I, as I said, I took out self-cleaning. What I'm trying to do there, 
I'm trying to create roughness, you know, the roughers are, you know, the lotus effect, you know. So I'm trying to mimic that lotus effect in metals and alloys without putting the coating that normally people do. You know, people put hydrophobic coating and it works. But coatings have a problem, they go away after a while, they crack. So I'm, my approach has been to use the innate microstructure of alloys and then do some etching on it to create the roughness. Okay. What's that? For the fiber. See here I will create a multi-phase microstructure. Many microstructures are multi-phase. Then you will etch it so one phase etches deeper than the other. So that's how you create roughness rather than to deposit by photolithography and so on. So that is my approach. I don't have time because that is another lecture on self-cleaning. I used to give it every year with, when Dr. Ashutosh Sharma was here. He was very interested in... So I'm trying to, like you have relationship between mechanical properties and microstructure, the hall patch equation, right? You know, but there's no relationship between microstructure and hydrophobicity. There is no relationship between microstructure and corrosion. Very limited. And that's a new, uh, what you may call, uh, love in my life at this late stage that can I start developing materials this was for transportation for water industry and this is what I was telling you that we have a major industry university center on water and perhaps IIT could set up a sister center because your people in chemical engineering mechanical engineering and materials uh, that's water is going to be the next oil on which there will be fights and, and Milwaukee is one of the eight United Nations centers with water industry, you know. So if, if you can focus, bring people from different departments to work on water, I, I think that that, that that could get even more funds than transportation because water shortage is a big problem here. You know, even pollution of Ganges, you'll see in my, la in my school, they are developing instant center, sensors, you know. Graphene sensors are there. So handheld sensors, they will tell you in two minutes how, how impure is the water and then what you can do to remove the impurity. Huge push on, on water purification, filtration, sensing, and my work on materials. I mean, you will be surprised how much water you lose by leakage in pipes. It's trillions of gallons each year in US. I'm sure it is here. You will see many pipes, there's a leakage. It is, imagine if you could have self-sealing. You did get a hole because of corrosion, but it learned how to seal itself. There are self-sealing fuel tanks in U.S. military vehicles. You shoot a bullet through a fuel tank, the fuel gets out, it reacts with the polymer, it swells, and it seals the whole. So imagine if you had self-sealing pipes, how much water you will save here, you know. So that, that's the connection to water. I, I took out the self-cleaning, but I, I have other presentation I'll be happy to share with you. Okay, the way it works that if you have aluminum graphite and graphite has a hexagonal structure, very low shear strength. So although initially it is present as discrete particles, after rubbing against this, the piston ring, you generate a completely graphitic layer. Even though in the beginning you have 2.5% of graphite, now after a little bit of tribo deformation, it becomes completely coated with graphite. So when graphite is rubbing against graphite, there is very little friction. Your pencil is actually, that's how your pencil writes. So that is how it becomes self-lubricating. I'm not saying you don't require any liquid lubricant. You will require liquid lubricant in the beginning. Once the graphite film has formed, now the friction coefficient goes down and you will reduce the need for oil. That's how it becomes self-lubricating. You know, you, in, in syntactic forms, you can control, you know how you make metal forms. Uh, you know, you put some foaming agent, right? And it, it, it becomes like a foam and it solidifies. There you have no control on the cell size of the pores. And it's open to airs. I did show one slide that the energy absorbed per unit weight in syntactic form is much higher than energy absorbed per unit weight in open cell forms. Open cell forms are very light 
and, and their properties are much lower than, than what we are creating, you know. So that, that's the advantage of these synthetically produced self, uh, you know, uh, syntactic forms rather than just uh, bubbling air in a metal and it becomes a foam. That's a very uncontrolled structure. It's good for uh, low, low property uses. But I'm trying to shoot that it becomes high energy absorption capability by, by introducing tailored micro balloons, including micro balloons of fly ash. Oh, I, I told you there are, you will take hollow micro balloons, put it, this, this question was here, you will put it in a tube. You might want to put a fugitive binder and then you melt liquid metal and you apply pressure so the liquid metal infiltrates the spaces between the hollow micro balloons and solidifies. So that's how you produce a syntactic foam. Now, nothing very fancy and you got people in chemical engineering who will tell you exactly the pressure and the rate of infiltration and so on. I learned from them. Only thing is, you know, we are infiltrating liquid metal, they infiltrate water and oil and so on. All that science is known, science of percolation through porous media. In fact, my collaborator is another, I should have mentioned his name, is Krishna Pillai. He did his bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering. He is one of the best uh, modelers of flow through porous media. So I got him entangled into, into my work and I think we're going to publish a couple of papers. It's again IIT Kanpur person in uh, in United States, you know. I might mention, if you will allow me, a little bit of. Don't think I'm trying to talk about how great I am, but 20 years ago, 10 years ago, the to two top people in UW Milwaukee in research were Dr. Arun Garg, product of IIT Kanpur, and myself, you know. So when it's it's they they made a very good very good name in US and, and there's no reason why you can't do it here. That's my, really the message that I'm trying to convey and I hope I have provided enough evidence that much of this work was done by people here in surroundings here. Uh, that, that desire to be world leader right sitting here without ever stepping out of India, that is what I see as the future, you know. Enough of going to abroad and studying and coming back and, and, and trying to transfer technology from there. We should be the exporters because no other countries have got so many young people as you are. Other countries are aging, their minds are decaying, you have the future. All right? Anything else? Oh. Sir, you spoke about CETs being used in the, in the metal composites. Could you please comment on the status of inorganic nanotubes or counterparts being used somewhere else in the... Yeah, there is a lot of research and a lot of it is going on in China now that they are putting not only carbon nanotubes, but nanotubes of other inorganic materials in metals. And the interest is the same that can I get very high modulus and very high strength. A lot of this work is coming out of China. I'll tell you a story, in many years ago, when there were 10 papers out in MMC area, there were at least five out of India, one out of China and maybe four out of US and Japan. Now, out of 10, nine are from China. And the tenth one is written by a Chinese in the United States. So, just I, I can I have taken out some powerpoints from my presentation, but there is a lot of work. Just go to the internet, putting nanotubes in metals. It's a huge growing field, but mainly out of China, you know. from you. Okay. Thank and you so uh, much. Thank you. And I'm also happy to see amongst the audience, faculty, staff members, not only from our department, from the other department, uh, guests from outside the city, our doctoral, masters, as well as undergraduate students who are all here, from first year all the way till final year and the dual degree. So it's a very wide cross-section and thank you so much for the 
Okay. And thank you for inviting me and putting up with me and listening to me. I mean, thank you so much. Not done yet. Oh, not done yet. Yeah, we also have a certificate that you can actually, you know, kind of uh, <laughs> place it in. So one for the wall, one for your table. Oh my God! Oh my God! Thank you, my God. And from all of us uh, from our department, we also have basically a T-shirt of our department. Of your department. Okay, so maybe so tomorrow I should come and wear this, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Professor Rodhi instantly uh, agreed to interact with the students as well. So I am teaching this course on materials processing, uh, which is 3 to 4 tomorrow. So he has agreed to come over there and talk something about cast metal matrix composite. No, I'll talk about graphene, right? You, because they, that they have heard, you know, they, they pa your field, part of metallurgy. Fair enough. Because I want to learn something from these students. I wanted to learn something from the cast, <laughs> but uh, it's perfectly fine. So, uh, we'll hopefully some of us will be interacting again tomorrow. Just thank you all and thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you very much. And maybe some of the students who would like to basically stay back can stay back and interact with you.